Okay, hello, my name is Michael Downey, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the fourth AWRI webinar for the 2018-19 program. Now, this week's session takes a look at global supply and demand trends, providing insights into key export markets and opportunities for Australian wine. Now, before I jump over to our speaker uh, for the session, just some quick reminders for the audience. To provide a comment or to ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar toolbar, type in your question and click to send. Uh, if you'd like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the underscore AWRI. Also, this webinar is being recorded and um, will be available to view later this afternoon via the AWRI's YouTube channel. Um, all registrants will receive a notification with a link to this recording. Now, I'd also like to thank and acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for AWRI webinars. For those of you that have just joined us, welcome. Today's topic is State of Play, Key Markets for Australian Wine, and it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the, ses for the session, Kirsten Hannan. Uh, Kirsten uh, from Wine Australia. Kirsten has extensive experience in helping guide strategy and planning in the leisure, travel, tourism, and more recently, wine sector. And it's fantastic to have her here today to share some insights. So enough from me, over to you, Kirsten. Thank you, Michael, for that lovely introduction and welcome to all those taking the time to uh, listen to my presentation today. I really appreciate um, your all busy people and so I Thank you very much for that. So today, uh, I just wanted to sort of cover off and give you basically a, a setting the scene of, of what's happening in Australian wine exports uh, and what are the global conditions that uh, are impacting on the, our exports? What does it mean for Australian exports? You know, are there opportunities in some of our key markets? And um, and just I also wanted to touch on some of the activities that Wine Australia are doing that. Uh, I would just like to sort of promote as well. So just in terms of setting the scene, I feel like this infographic is a really good way to do that because you can quickly identify that exports have increased significantly over the last 12 months, um, up 10% in volume and 20% in value. But, you know, you could ask yourself what's led to this increase. You'll also see at first glance, we could see that several factors at play they've got different results between markets. We've got China, which has contributed to the growth up 55% in value and 47% in volume. And without China's strong result, we still had an increase in exports, but this was much more subdued. It's, you know, if you take them out of the picture, it was up 3% in value and 2% in volume. But we're still experiencing issues in places such as the US. Um, and we can also see an increase in exports in the $10 and above category. So now I'm just sort of going to sort of take you through some of the global conditions that are impacting on Australian wine exports. Uh, just briefly, I'll sort of introduce the, the, the things here before I delve into them a bit more. We've got global spending power shifts. Uh, we've also got a volatile political economic environment that we're dealing with at the moment. We've got a lot of changing consumer trends, um, which is very interesting to see how they're impacting on, on different markets, whether they're a mature or an emerging market. And we're seeing pockets of growth in these areas because of these trends. Uh, constrained global supply. Uh, up until this year, we've had constrained global supply, but you know, signs going forward showing that that's easing. And then environmental risks still pose a concern, in particular climate change and biosecurity risks. So from an economic perspective, you know, looking at GDP, which is in the, um, the left chart, um, since the GFC, growth in GDP has been positive in most regions, but is clearly strongest in emerging and developing economies. Forecasts, though, do show a slowdown in certain economies. So in that chart, you can see advanced economies in the orange, um, they sort of come up for 2017, they peak at around 2018, but then forecast to slow. And then in those emerging markets, which is in the grey, uh, you see that they've been dropping considerably, but have recently risen back in 2017 and starting to sort of plateau off as a forecast. But China itself is actually starting to, is forecast to sort of slow down there as well. But the chart on the right, in terms of um, GDP per capita, 
we're actually seeing steady increases over time. So although the smaller economies have the fastest growing GDP, the advanced economies have much higher income levels per capita, which gives a more disposable income for luxury goods, including wine. So the increasing per capita consumption that I was just talking about is the result of the rising middle class. This global spending power shift, according to World Bank McKinsey Global Institute, is coming from the retired and the mature age persons in developing markets and in particular China. And you can see in this chart here that um, the per capita consumption growth um, has gone from, it's, it's around in the last 15 years, 58%. And it's forecast to reach 75% by 2030, even though population is falling per capita consumption is growing. So in our exporter update 2018, Cassandra Wisenreed, Chief, Chief, who is the chief economist at EFIC, that is the Export Finance and Insurance Corporation, gave us some insights into the global economic conditions and how these affect Australian wine in exports. And she referred to these as headwinds and tailwinds. So the first headwind she identified was restrictive trade policy. And with the escalation of USA tariffs and tit for tat measures that restrict trade have spiked the global economic policy uncertainty index. Australia's contribution to trade between the USA and China is small, only 0.4% of GDP, but an all out trade war will hurt Australia with its small open economy. The second headwind she identified was financial volatility. Low interest rates um, have encouraged an unprecedented, unprecedented debt binge, especially in emerging markets. If interest rates rise, growth will be diluted as government funds are redirected to paying back debts. And the final one she identified was geopolitical tensions, as we all hear on the radio constantly every day. Um, you know, one example of that tension is with Brexit, creating a lot of uncertainty, especially in the export market. But, you know, um, on the upside, the tailwinds assisting Australian wine exporters overseas where the Chinese middle class is surging and they're willing to pay a premium for quality products and market access is improving. The Australian dollar has depreciated against the greenback this year as well, down almost 10% since its January peak. This decline will boost export competitiveness in most overseas markets as it makes Australian products more affordable. Markets expect the Reserve Bank of Australia to keep interest rates at their current level for a while longer yet and predict that Australian dollar will stay around the current level for another couple of years. So how much are people drinking in terms of alcohol? Well, Euromonitor International recently reported that the global alcoholic beverage industry experienced a 1% growth to US 1576 billion in 2017. At first glance, this might not appear to be a significant increase, but when you consider the alcoholic beverage sector's performance over the last five years, which has been down, it's quite notable. Uh, just talking you through the chart on the left uh, might seem a little confusing, but what they've done is they've broken up alcoholic beverage consumption uh, by regions. Uh, so the market sizing is in the top bit and then the, the, fo the forecast of so the compound average growth rate is sort of indicated in these bars down below the uh, market sizing. Uh, so what we've got here is spirits is in the gray, uh, sorry, correction, the orange. And you can see as well, you know, such a high amount, as well as beer, which is in that sort of um, lighter blue, grey blue colour. So Asia Pacific definitely do consume the highest amount of alcohol compared to any other region. Uh, and growth has come across a number of categories, including wine and driven by the Asian market, which you can see that growth increase across there. And these, it's interesting as well that these pockets of growth are the result of con consumer trends shaping the industry, which I'll touch on later. So Western Europe, as you can see here, when we sort of look at wine consumption, they, on the flip side, they are the largest um, wine consuming region in the world. Um, but you can see that consumption has been falling, but only marginally, particularly in major producing countries such as France, Italy, and Spain. Over the past four years, consumption in Western Europe has fallen at an average rate of 0.1% per annum. 
This has implications for Australian producers as the producers in Europe seek alternative markets for their wine production. Asia Pacific is the fastest growing region for wine consumption with growth of 4.9% per annum over the last four years. While volumes are still relatively small in comparison to Western Europe, they are quickly gaining on North America. Growth in value from Asia Pacific outpaced the US plus 4.6% to US dollars 69.3 billion compared to the plus 2.6% to US dollar 55.8 billion. So now I'll go into the global trends which are shaping the industry. Look, the overall alcohol market trends are reflected to varying degrees in wine and in different markets. The growth in mainstream products, um, the lower price ones that is, is in different markets and products from the growth in premium products, which is more pronounced in mature markets. That's those sort of interesting pockets uh, of growth that we've been seeing. Uh, health and well-being, uh, that's a huge one. It's uh, as consumers look for lower alcohol in adult soft drinks, smaller pack sizes and serving options. This trend also goes hand in hand with the premiumization trend, which is to drink less but better quality. Spirits and wine will spearhead innovation in both lower and non-alcohol alternatives in the short to medium term. I just want to show on that image for the healthy living that uh, I pulled this from the internet from an article um, that talked about Tesco launching a range of lower alcohol wines after seeing demand more than double in their supermarket. Uh, so I'll move on to the cross pollinization one now. We've got uh, hybrids and blurring of category lines. So what's driving this change here, this trend is millennials and Gen Zs in particular, as they're looking for unique and different products that are Instagrammable. Innovations include combining lager and ale yeast strains, radical barrel aging amalgamations, wines and gins infused with herbs, fusion whiskies incorporating Indian, Scotch and international blends and new cocktails. Um, the image that I've provided here is one that I pulled off the Alibaba website, which is a Nirvana herbal white wine. So that's a very interesting one too. Uh, moving on to the connected consumer. So advances in digital technology are making it easier for consumers to connect. Innovations such as integrated voice enabled devices allowing for seamless recommendations, augmented reality labels, near field communication technology transforming products into content hubs and digital touch points, spectrometry sensors, voice activated decanters and smart bottles. These are just to name a few. Um, and they're all clever marketing strategies to not only build awareness, but to also increase conversion. So the image in this one is actually a smart bottle where people, it's almost like a, a, an iPhone where you can go and touch and learn uh, about the producer, where it's come from. And uh, it provides that, ex that immediate information, education that people are sort of searching for to be assured that they've actually purchased a wine that's of good quality. It's also something that they could show off to their friends. So it has a lot of value in that particular product. And moving on to corporate responsibility. Uh, so this is an interesting one. Customers are challenging the established positioning and promotional marketing rules as they demand that companies need to be ethical and demonstrate corporate responsibility by showing stories of authenticity and craftsmanship. Some other trends as well uh, that are coming is in the areas that the rise of the craft and artisan products, um, as well as cocktails, which are quite popular with the younger generation. So if you just look at supply over time, you can see that it generally exceeds demand. Um, and in particular for 2017, uh, we've had uh, constrained supply, which has affected exports to a number of markets. Um, one example is in Chile and Argentina, they had a reduction in supply. And normally Chile sent a lot of bulk over to China, but um, they actually redirected their supply to Argentina to help them out. So we've actually seen a decrease um, in their bulk supply to China, which is, but as I'll go into later, this will, the opportunity might be gone now. This um, constraints help drive the volume and value of Australian wine exports in bulk containers to record figures, to record figures in particular. Um, for 2018, however, there's been um, 
a predicted turnaround. So while there was constrained global wine production in 2017, the bar chart here shows that there were good harvests in Chile and Argentina in 2018. As a result, Australia has gone from the fifth largest source of global wine production to the seventh in 2018 at 4%, which you can see in the pie chart. And this has resulted in increased competition going into uh, 2019. When it comes to production, Australia does over-index, exporting around 59% of our production, which is higher than other major competitors apart from Spain and Chile. Australia's average price for bottled wine is the fourth highest in the top 10 after France, the US and New Zealand. So what does this mean for Australian exports? Well, in uh, the year ending June 2018, Australian wine exports increased by 20% in value to 2.76 billion. So that's this, uh, this column over here on the right. So you can see it's moved from just over 2.3 to up to 2.76. And it's the highest growth rate in 15 years. Volume grew by 10% to a record 852 million litres. Or, and that's 95 million nine litre case equivalent. The average value per litre increased by 9% to $3.24. And that's the highest level in almost a decade. The value of wine shipped in glass bottles increased by 19% to 2.2 billion, while uh, volume increased by 8% to 376 million litres, or 42 nine litre case equivalent, million line, nine litre case equivalents. Uh, value growth outpaced volume growth, resulting in a 10% increase in the average value per litre to a record $5.94 per litre. And the average value of bottled exports increased to 69 of Australia's 127 export destinations, with demand for premium Australian wine in Northeast Asia being the biggest contributor to the increase. And that's what this uh, green column here represents. That's the total volume increase. There was healthy growth at nearly all price segments as well. Exports above $10 per litre increased 45% to a record 855 million, reflect, reflecting the premiumization trend. The key price segments which drove this growth was the 20 to 29.99 and the $50 to 99.99 categories, both increasing by over 80%. Also driving growth in overall value is the $2.49 and under segment, reflecting the increase in demand for bulk shipments. Uh, another interesting fact is the Australian wine, red wine, continued to perform strongly with a 25% increase in value in the past 12 months to 2.1 billion. Driving this growth were red wine prices um, priced above the $10 per litre, increasing by 48% to 797 million. Exports to China, including Hong Kong and Macau, the UK and Singapore were the key drivers behind red wine growth. So what we're finding is with the rising export prices, this is flowing through to grape um, prices as well. And you can see a clear correlation in this graph that they both are quite connected. In the two years that there were exceptions, however, uh, this was when wineries anticipated a low yielding year that didn't eventuate. The increase in prices occurred across both commercial and premium grapes as well. So just touching on um, China, which is, uh, as I indicated in the beginning slide, that's grown by 55%. So the volume of imported wine continues to grow. Uh, Australia's share of bottled import volume was 20% and ranked second behind France with a share of 38%. While France has experienced exponential growth in bottled wine imports to China since year ending March 2010, this has slowed in recent years with annual growth from Australia outpacing overall imports, that is France and other new world markets such as Chile. Other influences on China is the growing middle uh, class with their greater disposable income, driving growth in imported wine. Other trends, many linked to that rising middle class, impacting on the imported wine market include 
younger consumers are perceiving still wine as modern, fashionable, healthy, and sophisticated. Wine is also lower in alcohol, funnily enough, than other traditional alcoholic beverages, therefore is considered a healthier option compared to those. So that fits in with that um, health and wellness trend. There's also strong demand from uh, Chinese consumers in terms of wine education. So a lot of, uh, you know, with the younger generations, they don't know a lot about wine and they're very thirsty for knowledge. Uh, and a lot of them consume uh, wine in Western style restaurants, bars, clubs, KTVs and at home during dinner. Uh, another with the connectedness trend is e-commerce is transforming the market. As much as 20% of wines are sold online and well-known brands sell best online as consumers go there to buy rather than browse. So in terms of uh, Australian wine exports, to mainland China reached 1 billion for the first time, a 66% increase from the previous 12 months. Volume increased by 50% to 176 million litres, leading to an increase in average value per litre of 11% to $5.71. Uh, the graph on the right clearly shows the steep rise in Australian exports. Um, you can see that demonstrated there and overtaking the US back in 2015. While all price points contribute to value growth, it's apparent that the Chinese appetite for premium Australian wine was the largest driver. Exports valued above $10 per litre more than doubled in the past 12 months to 486 million. Both the $50 to $99.99 and the above $200 segments more than tripled in value, while robust value growth also came from the $10 to $14.99 and $20 to $29.99 segments. So now just looking in the US, it, it pretty much remains a, a tale of two markets. On the one hand, there is big volume in the commercial market price below the US $8 per bottle. And according to IRI worldwide, this part of the market holds a 54% volume share of the US off trade, but it is in decline as consumers are trading up to higher price wines. Um, this trend is also apparent in our export data. All price segments below $10 per litre are in decline, particularly the $2.50 to $4.99 segment. Because this part of the market has historically been where Australia has sold most of its wines, this weakening is a major factor in the decline of the overall export figures. On the other hand, there is a premium end of the market with a 46% share of the off-trade wine market in the USA. This part of the market is enjoying robust growth. Again, the premiumization trend is reflected in the Australian export data. Nearly all price points above $10 per litre are in growth, albeit off small bases. As the market moves through this transition, the effect of the commercial end of the market and overall export figures should lessen, allowing for Australian premium wines to have a greater influence. The challenge is to repeat the success we've had at the commercial end of the market at the premium end. The graph at the right looks at the US consumption of still wine for 2017 compared to the 2018 forecast, which highlights the opportunity at the premium end. Some of the challenges uh, we're aware of for Australian wine exports are centered around the three tier distribution system and the difficulty in getting products listed by an importer when there's so much competition. The greatest competition comes from the Californian wines, but with growing in interest in niche wines, there are opportunities here for other varieties red blends and rosé. Uh, so moving on to the UK, this is an area that we should be defending our position as number one. In volume terms, more Australian wine gets shipped to the UK than any other destination. Exports to the UK increased by 12% in both value and volume to 384 million and 246 million litres. The value increased slightly outpace volume to increase average value per litre by 1% to $1.56. We dominate the commercial end through bulk exports. With more than 80% of wine exported to the UK shipped in bulk containers and 42% of all Australian bulk wine shipments are destined for the UK. The premium wine market remains a challenge for Australia with exports priced at $10 per litre and above declining by 16% to 24 million this year. However, there are several factors which Australia can leverage to grow premium wine consumption. Australia is also number one in the UK off-trade market, which is up 3% in value to 1.2 billion pounds. 
carrying with it a solid reputation for value for money and food friendly wines. The graph on the right shows the volume change in price points in the off trade, which shows that there are opportunities for Australia in the higher price brackets. I just want to point out that you'll see a very large decline in the $20 pound and above. Um, however, this is off a very considerable low base. With on trade, there is a move towards wine by the glass with strong interest in more premium and higher priced options. And as we all know, Brexit has created a tough and uncertain trading environment for wine with wine prices rising, trade looking to cut costs, um, and with the proposed soft Brexit, this, this doesn't uh, at this point appear to present opportunities for Australian exports. So I'll just quickly touch on Australia and that um, Australian wine has 86% of the domestic market by volume and 76 by value, and the market really hasn't been growing uh, very much here. But we are seeing that there's opportunities in the direct-to-consumer channels and online, uh, and, um, and there should be continued investment in expanding and diversifying tourism-related activities around the cellar door. So there's been interesting um, uh, research conducted on that, uh, which I won't be able to touch on today, but um, that's uh, something that I'd like to talk about in maybe another webinar one time. <laughs> um, and just in terms of sort of really quickly delving into the other markets, we've got a lot of small markets with higher forecast growth rates, um, the exception of being India. Um, we've got a lot of interest in alternative varieties um, and also alternative packaging as well as organic and biodynamic. So what activities are we doing at the moment? Uh, you've probably, uh, the majority of you I can see on the list uh, are probably well aware of our $50 million package. I won't go into detail on that, but I just wanted to touch on two activities that are occurring uh, in regards to capability development. Uh, the first one at the moment is uh, growing wine exports. So what we're doing is we're running a number of um, workshops. Uh, you can see a list of all the locations where we're conducting those workshops um, across Australia. And we're really trying to provide uh, practical and hands-on um, skills to help and tools to help um, potential exporters or even current exporters, you know, determine what markets are appropriate to them or where should they be shifting. Uh, so this is, um, I'm really excited about this. Um, there's, there's going to be a lot of um, uh, FOB calculators as well as working out a sort of an idea, um, uh, sales plan forecasting as well as sort of relooking at your branding and whatnot so it will be very interesting and I encourage anyone to come along and register online to this um, might be a little bit difficult to go onto our website and find it you will just have to follow the links at the top look for the 50 million dollar package and then you'll find these um, uh, seminars where you can register through that on our wine Australia website in terms of uh, so the another exciting program, and if you are interested in um, learning a bit more about growing wine tourism, we're also offering a number of seminars here as well, uh, with the first ones conducted on the dates and in the locations provided on the right. Uh, also, please, once again, I encourage you all to uh, register online. If this, if this is something that you're interested or in, you're already delving into, this is really good. Um, information here to sort of help you understand tourism and wine tourism in particular as well as understanding the uh, industry terminology and really familiarizing yourself with um, how tourism can work for your business and uh, I won't go into much detail here because I do I believe I've run over time but just wanted to quickly touch on a number of marketing activities that we're conducting. So in China, uh, we've got the Alibaba group in, with a Tmall priority. Uh, we actually have our own dedicated uh, Tmall website that uh, Wine Australia has, and uh, we're continually working out how to develop that, and we gave it a trial run with the recent 99. There's also Pro Wine uh, in Shanghai on the 13th to 15th of November, and the Chengdu Food and Wine Festival 2019, as well as the uh, China Roadshow cities have been announced for next year as well. In USA, we've continued to offer our market entry program, also working on the Full Circle Beverage Conference, the Aussie Wine Week, 
the Wine Spectator New York Wine Experience, which is all happening right now, and the Aussie Wine Month, and uh, the very successful Decanted, there'll be a part two of that as well. And in the UK and EU, uh, number of activities off the vine, uh, the Nordic Roadshow, which is about to occur. Uh, we've got a number of tastings in various uh, countries, uh, as well as uh, pro wine. And in other markets, we've got Hong Kong Wine and Dine, uh, promotion preparations, as well with Watson and Dairy Farm in Hong Kong, and a number of sponsored tasting events that are co-organised between Austrade and Wine Australia. So I appreciate that there was a lot to get through and I know that there's a lot of markets that uh, are of interest to people, but I've only focused on um, some of our key markets here. But if you ever need any information or anything particular to a market that you're interested in or need some further analysis, please don't hesitate to call us. Um, uh, my, my email address is uh, on this slide here. Uh, as well as you can also visit our website to find a lot of market insights. We also do a lot of regional analyst days where we go out to the regions and do one-on-one. -on -one. So if this is something that's interesting for you, then please let us know. We also produce um, some weekly market bulletins. Uh, so this is where we sort of take particular topics that might be of interest and we go into a bit more detail about those. You can actually subscribe to those through our website uh, and they're a very good way of getting a really quick and sometimes quirky way of getting uh, data presented to you. There's also LinkedIn and we also publish a number of industry journals and my contact details are below. So I just wanted to thank you for that and thank you, Michael. Okay, great. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, I'd like to first thank a um, extend a thank you to Kirsten for coming in and providing the content for this uh, very incisive and informative session. And I'd also like to thank the audience for participating in, in today's session. Um, all attendees will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording. Um, as I mentioned, the next AWRI webinar is on Thursday, the 4th of October. Details should be visible there on your screen now. Um, thank you again for participating and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.